Hey, welcome to Sci-Fi Secrets. So this is going to be a long one because I want to talk about Ben Bova's Grand Tour universe, and there's a lot to talk about. First off, I want to talk about Ben Bova himself. He unfortunately died almost exactly a year ago from when I say this. He died on November 29th of 2020. He had just finished a second book in the final three in his universe, the Outer Planets trilogy. The second book was published after his death, so it doesn't look like we're ever going to get an ending to that trilogy. Ben Bova writes the hardest of hard sci-fi. If you want to read books that not only you can't find holes in, but can teach you about how things actually work, despite the fact a few of those things happen to be outdated knowledge now, then Ben Bova is your guy. There are no cases of deus ex machina in Ben Bova's works, no Mary Sue's, no cliche hero's journey, just realistic adventures, discoveries, and fights in business, politics, science, and space. You can pick your poison with Ben Bova. Do you want to read a realistic story of corporate espionage? Political battles for independence? Space battles with realistic physics in astoundingly simple ways to kill entire colonies that you never thought of? Or maybe you are like me, and your favorite will be the exploration books, where Ben Bova takes you on a journey in his imagination as to how life can evolve almost anywhere in the solar system. So which books do you want to read? There are many overlapping books in the Grand Tour universe, so it can be a bit daunting at first. You can read them in several different ways. So this is how the grid I'm showing you works. The top line is the first series in the universe, but the thec... <laughs> the second. The second and third books in the series, namely Privateer and Empire Builders, take place after Mars does. Well, de depending on the timeline you go by. So the first book in each line takes place after the line above it, but the following books may overlap. Um, but they are the direct sequels to the first book in the series. So you should read from right to left. Just pick somewhere along the uh, left-hand column where you want to start. So... Um, Dan Randolph is the main character in Power Sat, Privateers, and Empire Builders. Dan Randolph is basically Elon Musk, long before Elon Musk. Sometimes I honestly wonder if Elon is emulating Dan. Um, you'll see Ben Bova's predictions come true quite often. This will become a reoccurring theme, you might notice. The stories of Dan Randolph are the stories of how the Earth finally broke away from one planet and ventured out into space, not just for science, but to elevate man to the next level in his evolution, to become a spacefaring race, to profit off the stars for the benefit of all mankind. Dan has to battle against all the old guard in business, trying to keep him from succeeding and ruining their profit models. But billionaires take their bank accounts very seriously and will resort to dirty tactics. These are some amazing stories of innovation and cutthroat business. Will the other corporations be able to keep Dan from elevating humanity to the next level and drive him into bankruptcy? Or will Dan be able to save humanity from its certain death and its own pollution and waste that was predicted? Privateers, by the way, was the first book Ben Bova wrote IRL in the Grand Tour universe, so it's a bit odd. He wrote it in 1985, before the fall of the USSR, so it is the only novel in the universe that has the Soviet Union still around. That is why some timelines don't include it at all. But personally, I think it's a good book and would suggest reading it. If you're like me and like Power Sat, then you will like Privateers even more. Personally, I think it's the better of the two books. Power Sat, despite being one of the later books written in the universe, written in 2005, is the very first book chronologically in the Grand Tour universe. But honestly, I don't think I can suggest you starting there in good faith. Power Sat is good, but it's not nearly as good as some of the other books in the universe. And honestly, there's no need to start there. Even though everything is in the same universe, and you may recognize more names if you read them in chronological order, a lot of books in the universe can be read as standalone novels. So if you don't want to jump straight into the deep end by reading the three Dan Randolph books, you might want to start with one of the solo planet titled books, like Venus or Mercury, but we will get to those in a minute. The Mars series follows Jamie Waterman. It consists of Mars, Return to Mars, and Mars Life. In these books, we follow Jamie as he explores Mars, but the mission does not go to plan, and the 25 crewmates struggle just to stay alive in the harsh and deadly climate of Mars. Jamie is forced to go off plan, and while fighting to stay alive with supplies dwindling, he chances upon something unexpected. If you want to find out what that is, you'll need to read Mars for yourself. Next, we have the Moonbase Saga, Moonrise and Moonwar. 
These are very different than the other novels in that they are the story of how the residents of the moon won their independence from Earth. Douglas Stavanger has a dream, and it's not for power or wealth, but progress. The New Morality, a fanatical religious group that has taken over many of the Earth governments, wants to stop him. They believe that teaching evolution is a sin, and the New Morality also does not trust scientists. But Stavanger is a scientist, and he wants to keep doing his research on the moon. But the moon base is full of scientists, not soldiers, so he can't just fight for his independence like many countries did on Earth. He has to use his intellect to win, preferably without bloodshed. Now we get to the Asteroid Wars novels. These are a fun series if you're like me and want to see what actual battles in space might be like. Well, okay, fun might not be the best word. It's interesting and eye-opening to see how fragile everyone is out there in space. The first book in the series once again deals with Dan Randolph, but this series is not about corporate espionage as much as the first three Randolph books. It's about mining the asteroid belt for unimaginable riches while saving the Earth at the same time. But as the series progresses, it becomes about the lack of laws out there in space, and how that leads to some dirty and deadly happenings when the wrong men are given the power to destroy without any oversight. There's one very brutal event that happens in these books that stands out. The destruction of the chrysalis habitat. A haven for the rock rats to raise their families. Yanis Ritsos was alone on duty in Chrysalis's communication center when Harbin's ultimatum came through. It was a dull night shift, nothing but boringly routine chatter from the far-scattered ships of the miners and prospectors, and the coded telemetry sent routinely from their ships. With everything in the center humming along on automatic, and no one else in the comm center at this late hour, Yanni opened the computer subroutine he used to write poetry. He had hardly written a line when the central screen suddenly lit up to show a dark-bearded man whose eyes glittered like polished obsidian. Attention Chrysalis, the stranger said in guttural English. This is the attack vessel Samarkand. You are harboring the fugitive Lars Fuchs. You will turn him over to me in ten minutes or suffer the consequences of defiance. Annoyed at being interrupted in his writing, Yanni thought it was some jokester in the habitat pulling a prank. Who is this? he demanded. Get off this frequency, it's reserved for incoming calls. The dark bearded face grew visibly angry. This is your own death speaking to you if you don't turn Fuchus over to me. Lars Fuchus? Yanni replied, only half believing his ears. God knows where he is. I know where he is, the intruder snapped, and if you don't surrender him to me, I will destroy you. Irritated, Yanni shot back. Fuchus hasn't been here in years, and he isn't here now. Go away and stop bothering me. Harbin stared at the comm screen and Samarkand's bridge. They're stalling for time, he thought. They're trying to think of a way to hide Fuchus from me. He took a deep breath, then said with deadly calm, Apparently you don't believe me. Very well. Let me demonstrate my sincerity. Turning to the weapons tech, Harbin ordered, Chop one of the habitat's modules. The man swallowed hard, his Adam's apple bobbing up and down. Sir, there are civilians in those modules. Innocent men and women. I gave you an order, Harbin snapped. But get off the bridge, I'll take care of this myself. The weapons tech glanced at the others on the bridge, looking for support. Chrysalis is unarmed, sir, said the pilot softly, almost in a whisper. Cold fury gripped Harbin. Get out, all of you, he said, his voice hard as ice. I'll tend to this myself. The entire bridge crew got up and swiftly went to the hatch, leaving Harbin alone in the command chair. He pecked furiously at the keyboards on his armrest, taking control of all the ship's systems. Fools and weaklings, he raged to himself. They call themselves mercenaries, but they're no good for anything except drawing their pay and pissing their pants in fear. Chrysalis is unarmed? I'll believe that when pigs fly. They're harboring Fuchus, and they're stalling for time, trying to hide him. Trying to lure me into sending my crew over there so they can ambush and slaughter them. I've seen ambushes, I've seen slaughters, and they're not going to do that to me and my crew. He called up the weapons display for the main screen, focused on the module of the Chrysalis closest to the ship, and jabbed a thumb against the key that fired the lasers. Three jagged lines slashed across the thin skin of the module. Puffs of air glittered briefly like puffs of a person's breath on winter's day. Give me Fuchis, he said to the comm screen. 
Yanni heard screams. What's going on? He asked the empty communications center. The face on the screen smiled coldly. Give me Fujis, he said. Before Yanni could reply, the comm center's door burst open and a woman in bright coral coveralls rushed in. Module 18's been ripped apart! They're all dead in there! Yanni gaped at her. She was from the life support crew. He could see by the color of her coveralls, and she was babbling so loud and fast he could barely understand what she was saying. We're under attack! She screamed. Call for help! Call who? Yanni asked. The executive officer stepped through the hatch into the bridge. Sir, she said crisply, her face a frozen, expressionless mask. I have a squad of twenty ready to board Chrysalis and search for Fuchis. They are armed with pistols and mini grenades, perfectly capable of dealing with whatever resistance the rock rats might try to offer. Harbin stared at her. Why are those fools trying to undermine me? I know what to do. You kill your enemies. Kill them all. Men, women, children, dogs, cattle. All and every one of them. Burn down their village. Burn their crops. Blast the trees of their orchards with grenades. Leave nothing alive. Sir, did you hear me? The exec asked, stepping closer to him. Harbin swiveled in his chair, slightly towards her. My hearing is perfect, he said calmly. Tell your troops to stand down. I won't need them. They can search the habitat. No, Harbin said softly, almost gently. That won't be necessary. Why risk them when we can destroy the habitat from here? But Fuchis... Fuchis will die with the rest of the rock rats, Harbin said. He wanted to laugh. It was all so simple. You killed your enemies, and then they will never be able to hurt you again. Why can't she see that? It's so logical, so beautifully clear. He dismissed the executive officer and began to calmly, methodically, thoroughly destroy Chrysalis and everyone in it. Once he realized what was happening, Yanni bolted from the useless comm center and down the habitat's central passageway. Ilona! I've got to find Ilona! The quarters were three modules down the passageway. At this time of night, she would be in their bedroom, asleep. He had to fight his way past a screaming mob on the module's airlock, fighting to grab the pitifully few spacesuits stored there. Why is this happening? Yanni asked himself as he ran towards the hatch that led to his wife. Why are they killing us? Then the bulkhead ahead of him split apart and a blast of air like a whirlwind lifted him off his feet and out into the dark, cold emptiness beyond. He had just enough time to understand that it didn't matter why or who or anything else. He was dead, and Ilana was too. And what started as a fight over controlling wealth ends with grudges, broken dreams, shattered lives, and many dead. If you are into realistic space war, then you might want to start your reading here. Now we've come to my favorite novel in the universe, Jupiter. It was one of the first of Ben Bova's books that I ever read, and it's no wonder why it got me hooked. As an introduction to the universe, it's great. You get a taste of the problems on Earth, and then are sent off to the depths of space to start one of the strangest journeys you will ever go on. If you do read it first, don't worry about the background of the new morality stuff and what's going on on Earth too much. Everything you need to know is in the book. Honestly, even if you do read all of the other books first, it won't explain much more than what Jupiter does. Most of that actually happens between the end of Empire Builders, where the climate change catastrophe cliff is predicted, and the beginning of The Precipice, where it has already happened. And those two books are chronologically right next to each other. There is no book in between them. Jupiter is unique in just about every way, but I guess it would have to be since Jupiter is such a foreign environment, and Grant Archer, our main character for this book, as well as Leviathans of Jupiter, the sequel, is forced out to Jupiter against his will. His hair is cut off, and he is forced, naked, into a pool of foreign liquid where his head is held under the surface by a 600 kilo gorilla named Sheena until he can't hold his breath anymore. And that's one of the more mundane parts of the book. <laughs> Have you seen the movie Abyss? Remember the liquid that they breathe? Yeah, that's kind of the idea for exploring Jupiter, only instead of a suit filled with the oxygenated liquid, they are in a spaceship full of it, where there is no way to get out of it because if there is even a tiny bit of air in the ship, when they descend into the depths of Jupiter's clouds, that air will allow the ship to compress and implode. So to eat, drink, and defecate in this liquid, they are surgically implanted with feeding tubes and such, as well as hundreds of microchips that allow them to link their brains directly to the ship to control it, and even at times hear each other's thoughts. What do you mean now that we have linked the crew's brains all together they can hear each other's private thoughts? 
That doesn't seem like it will be an issue at all. Putting a bunch of naked people together under extreme pressures, both physical and mental, with their brains all wired together where there is no privacy for days on end seems like a great idea. Could never cause any mental breakdowns, right? Totally normal environment for a human brain to adapt to. <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking and they have a lot of issues. The first and foremost of which is when their ship's systems fail and they begin to sink into the depths of Jupiter, where despite being in liquid, they will eventually be killed once the heat and pressure goes beyond what the ship can handle. Here's an excerpt from Jupiter. We are ready for separation and launch, Krebs said to Wu's image. Precisely at that moment, the computer's voice announced, Automated separation sequence initiated. Separation in 30 seconds. 29. The seconds stretched endlessly. Grant stood there aware that he was breathing a cold, slimy, oxygenated liquid, but no longer caring about that. The ship was coming alive, electrical currents racing through all its systems now, the propulsion units starting up, pumps beginning to stir, the electrons in the powerful superconducting coils singing their eternal hymn of perpetual motion, ceaseless devotion to their task. Full internal power, Krebs said. Ten seconds, announced the computer. Grant could feel the magneto-hydrodynamic channel stirring into life, preparing to take the star-hot plasma exhaust from the fusion generator and accelerate it through the ship's thruster tubes. Along his nerves, Grant felt the trembling thrill of anticipation. The clamps and bolts that held Zhang He to the station opened like a dozen faces breaking into smiles. Grant broke into a smile himself. We're free, he knew. We're on our own now. Ignition. The plasma thrusters started softly, gently. Grant felt their strength as if it were his own arms reaching out and lifting a heavy burden. As the thrust built up, his strength multiplied, tripled, quadrupled. He was stronger than any mere human could ever be. Stronger than Shayna. Stronger than a whole tribe of gorillas. He was lifting the entire ship, hurling it with fine, purposeful power and precision, flinging it away from the station and down onto the waiting clouds of Jupiter. Better than sex, this was better than life. I can rev up the thrusters to full power and blast this ship past Jupiter in an eye blink. I can push us out to the stars, to the farthest edge of the universe. Grant knew he had all the power of the universe throbbing inside of him. Superhuman energy, the strength and power of a god. That surge of arrogance snapped him back to reality. Pride goeth before a fall, he heard his father's voice in his mind. All this power, all this sensation of godlike strength is a trap, a snare, a temptation to the kind of hubris that has hurled many a good man into eternal damnation. Vanity, vanity. All is vanity. He stood trembling before his console, trying to regain control of himself, battling to keep the enormously seductive power of this illusion from deceiving him. It's an electronic mirage, he told himself. You are nothing more than a man who is linked electronically to the machinery of this ship. Control yourself. Still, he trembled. Is this what wrecked the first mission? Grant asked himself. Is this linkage so overwhelming that someone ran amuck with the ship's systems? He had touched a place in his own mind where he had wanted to run wild with the plasma thrusters, tear away all restraints, push full throttle just for the sheer joy of power. Yes, he realized now, and if I had done that, I would have killed us all. Still he trembled, but now it was with the understanding of the enormous dangers that dwelled within his own mind, his own soul. It's the age-old war, he realized, the never-ending struggle between responsibility and pleasure, between good and evil. This ship is simply a new battlefield in that eternal war. As long as we're human, the war goes on. But for an instant, Grant knew, he had been more than human. He still was. He still felt the pulsing power of the ship's generator and plasma thrusters. They were still a part of him. I am the ship. Power requires responsibility, he told himself. Extreme power requires extreme care. If you want a book that completely takes you out of this reality and throws you into another one that despite being entirely insane is still 100% believable and may even teach you something about the real universe, then this is a good place to start reading in the Grand Tour universe. But be warned, 
For some people, the lack of understanding of what's going on on Earth is a put-off. They want to understand what this whole new morality thing is, and if you think that's the case for you, then you're probably the kind of person that should just start with Power Sat in the very beginning. But as I said before, if you can just take the new morality stuff in stride, then it won't affect your enjoyment of the story, I believe. The novel Saturn is not actually about the planet, but rather it is about the space station designed for 10,000 people that is being sent to orbit Saturn. It's the biggest single structure we see off of the Earth in Grand Tour. It's the closest thing to a megastructure in this universe. Space Habitat Goddard is a cylinder 20 kilometers in length and 4 kilometers quote-unquote across, which I'm assuming means its diameter. It spins at one revolution every 45 seconds. This creates an environment of around 1 G at the interior surface. But as big as that is, it's dwarfed next to the Rama from Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama, which is about 20 kilometers in diameter and 50 kilometers long. But of course, that was not man-made, unlike space habitat Goddard, making Goddard one of the larger, if not largest, man-made structures in sci-fi. Don't quote me on this, but I think out of all the sci-fi books I have read, it's the largest man-made structure. But I'm probably forgetting something, or maybe multiple things. If you know of anything bigger that's man-made, let me know in the comments. And no, I do not consider the Death Star to be man-made. Nor, if I'm honest, and don't burn me at the stake for this, consider Star Wars to be sci-fi. Jedis are just space wizards. Deal with it. <laughs> and no, I don't think Metachlorians make it sci-fi. Just saying that there's a virus that turns you into a space wizard is an extra step to a space wizard. It's not a scientific explanation for lightning spells, levitation spells, speed spells, seeing the future, and the whole dark versus light theme popular in all of fantasy. Most good sci-fi doesn't have good guys and bad guys because life is always a gray area and everyone thinks that they are the good guy or the righteous one. Sorry, I got a little off track there. Okay, okay, back to reality. In this novel, Saturn, we see what happens when there is a power vacuum in the vacuum of space, and political intrigue follows as many vie for control of the station and its people. The sequel, Titan, however, does see the space station make orbit around Saturn and begin to study both its moon Titan as well as the rings themselves. Will they find life this deep in space, or will the station be destroyed from within? Next we have another solo novel, Venus. Venus does have Lars Fuchs from the Asteroid Wars in it, and he is trying to collect a reward just to stick it to his enemy from the Asteroid Wars novels, Martin Humphreys. But really, there is no reason you can't read it solo. We all understand grudges, and it almost makes Lars Fuchs seem more mysterious and dangerous if you don't know who he is, as I didn't upon my first read. If you've read The Sea Wolf by Jack London, then your first encounter with Fuchs gives you an uneasy sense of deja vu. But thankfully, Lars Fuchs is nowhere near as coldly tyrannical as the Sea Wolf. In Venus, we see the exploration of dun, 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 Venus. <laughs> In this novel, we explore the hostile, unrelenting atmosphere of Venus and how it can possibly be survived by men exploring it. As happens in some of the planet titled books, Ben Bova has used his imagination to think up a life form that could live there despite it being an incredibly dangerous environment for humans. If you love adventure, innovation, and new ideas for how both life and exploration can function, then you will like Venus. So it's not too bad of a spot to start in the universe, but if you really want to understand Lars's motivations, then you will need to read the Asteroid Wars novels first. Mercury is much like Venus, both in environment and the fact it can be a solo book, but its characters come from previous novels. Mercury is our first real look at the owner of the Yamagata Corporation, featured in the Dan Randolph novels as well as the Asteroid Wars novels, completing the trio of billionaire innovators, Dan Randolph, Martin Humphreys, and now Saito Yamagata. Like most of the planet-titled novels, this one features both a search for life on the planet as well as the trials of surviving in the harsh environment. But this time, there is a grudge to be settled, and unlike in Venus, they don't want money, but revenge. Years ago, Earth was in the process of building a space elevator when religious fanatics destroyed it, dropping its 40,000 kilometer length across the planet, wiping out whole cities in the process. The force of it hitting the Earth was like a constant bomb going off for hours on end as it wrapped itself around the Earth like a belt. And Saito finds himself stranded with a man who blames him for this. How will it turn out? 
Will they find life on Mercury? Will Saito meet his end? Or will he succeed in his plans to make Mercury a launch station for deep space? The final book I want to talk about is the Sam Gunn Omnibus, which is a compilation of all the Sam Gunn stories plus a few more that can only be found in this book. Technically, Sam Gunn should probably be the first in chronological order, but Sam stands out in the Grand Tour universe because he is a fun character. Carefree Sam always has a plan or a scam or a mission he's on. He stands in stark contrast to the rest of the universe, because where everyone else needs hard work and dedication to get what they need just to survive, everything is handed to Sam on a silver platter, and just as quickly taken back away. His stories are fun and sometimes silly, but not really representative of the rest of the universe and its harsh rules and laws. As a teen, he was one of my favorite characters in all sci-fi, right up there with Beowulf Schaefer from Larry Niven's known space universe. These stories are some of Ben Bova's comedy books, so if you want a really lighthearted and fun introduction to some of the people and places in the Grand Tour universe, you can start here. But just remember that the other books are not so lighthearted. And also, just as a heads up, Sam Gunn has been accused of being a product of 1950s style thinking. So if that Buck Rogers style kind of thing bothers you, you might want to skip Sam Gunn altogether. He's a man's man and a ladies man. He's the daring adventurer, and if you get upset, well that's your choice. No reason for Sam to fret over it. <laughs> Alright, and we'll have to end it there because I actually have not read the New Earth book books yet or the Outer Planet books yet. I actually honestly didn't know that they existed until I started to do research for this video. So guess what I'm reading next? I'm uh, happy to find out that there are still Ben Bova books I haven't read. If they're anywhere near as good as the other ones I was just talking about, then I'm sure I'll have a good time. So I hope you pick up at least one of these books also, if for no other reason than to see what true hard sci-fi can be like. Everything you read in a Ben Bova book was scientifically accurate for when the book was written. Some things have changed, that is how science works, constantly trying to improve our understanding of the universe, even if it hurts people's feelings in the process. The truth has no concern with feelings, and it can't be swayed by twisted logic or a slick talker. That's why I love science, and that's why I made this channel. I think reading sci-fi is the most fun way to learn, and Ben Bova is the best teacher I had in my childhood. He taught me more about the universe than probably any single other person in my life. When he passed away, we lost a legend in sci-fi and a beautiful source of information and adventure. I wish I could have told him thank you. Lars, uh, Fuchs? I don't, I don't want to pronounce it the other way. We'll, we'll call him Fuchs.